Here I've got a nice integral to show you, and this comes from a viewer that I'll call the integral suggester. And that's because this person always sends me the nicest integrals to work out. So what do we have here? We have the integral from zero to infinity of sine x squared e to the minus x squared over x squared dx. Okay, so let's maybe see what our first step will be. Well, maybe we'll do something with integration by parts to see if we can get some sort of simplification occurring. Well, if we're doing integration by parts, then we need to choose something that is u and something which is dv. So we'll take u to be equal to sine of x squared times e to the minus x squared, and then we'll take dv to be equal to 1 over x squared dx. And you might look at that choice and think, well, why would we make that choice? And that's because anything that involves sine x squared or e to the minus x squared generally does not have an elementary antiderivative unless it's coupled with a very special function where you could do some sort of obvious substitution. But here we don't have that set up. So we pick out the portion of our integrand that has an elementary antiderivative and go from there. And so in this case, it's just the one over x squared term. Okay, now that we have u and dv picked, we can calculate du and v by differentiation and taking an antiderivative as necessary. So let's see, du, we'll need to use the chain rule and the product rule here. So we'll first get 2x times cosine x squared times e to the minus x squared. That's what we get from taking the derivative of sine x squared. And then next we'll have minus 2x times sine of x squared times e to the minus x squared. That's what we get from taking the derivative of e to the minus x squared. Okay, we've got du, now let's calculate v, which we can do by taking the antiderivative of one over x squared. Thinking about this as x to the minus two. So that will give us minus one over x, and then that's it. Okay, and I just realized I forgot a dx here to go with my du. Okay, now we have all the parts in place in order to perform integration by parts. So let's do it. So the formula is the integral will be u times v and then evaluated the endpoints. In this, in this case, we actually need to take limits for the endpoints. So let's see what u times v is. That will be minus sine of x squared e to the minus x squared over x. Again, u times v. We need to evaluate that as x approaches zero and as x approaches infinity. Those are of course both limits for two different reasons. This is because we have an infinity and this is because this object right here is discontinuous at zero. So the only way to make sense of this is via a limit. Okay, then what do we have after that? So we will have v times du. Well, notice that this x right here, which came from taking the derivative of x squared composed within these functions, will cancel out with this x. And then this minus sign will maybe cancel out with the minus sign built into the integration by parts formula. And in the end, we will have plus two times the integral from zero up to infinity of cos x squared e to the minus x squared minus sine of x squared e to the minus x squared dx. So now let's look at what we have and see if we can take care of this stuff that is outside of the integral. And in fact, we can. It's a fairly simple application of L'Hopital's rule to see that both of these limits will tend towards zero. Well, let's see, if x is tending towards infinity, then e to the minus x squared is tending towards zero, and this denominator will also push us towards zero. So both things are pushing us towards zero as x tends to infinity. As x tends towards zero, we have things pushing in two different directions, however. Sine of zero is zero, but then we have a zero in the denominator from this, but I think we can use L'Hopital's rule pretty handily and see that that will go to zero as well. So we're just left with this object right here. Then how can we simplify this? 
I think maybe a nice solution will involve rewriting these cosines and sines as complex exponentials. So let's do that. So now we'll have this is equal to two. We have the integral from zero up to infinity. We can rewrite cosine of x squared as cosine of minus x squared. Then we have e to the minus x squared. The next, I can bring this minus sign into the sign, given the fact that sine is an odd function. So we have plus sine of minus x squared e to the minus x squared, and then dx outside of all of that. And I did that small step because it will help us rewrite this using complex exponentials. So in particular, I'll rewrite cosine as the real part of e to the minus i x squared, and the sine thing will be the imaginary part of that. Okay, so let's make that rewriting step. We have twice the integral from zero up to infinity. We have the real part of e to the minus i times x squared. And then since this is a real value function, I can multiply that through. So we'll have e to the minus x squared. So let's talk our way through this. So by Euler's formula, we know that this guy right here expands as cosine minus x squared plus i times sine minus x squared. So if we extract the real part, we extract the cosine, but that's what this symbol here does, it, it extracts the real part. And furthermore, if we extract the imaginary part, we extract the sine, so that's what we'll have for the next part. So we have this is plus the imaginary part of the same thing. So let's write that down e to the minus i x squared, e to the minus x squared, and then we have dx outside of all of this and a big parenthesis there. But we can combine these two objects, well, it's really the same object in two different operators, a real part operator and an imaginary part operator, using exponent rules. So maybe we would write this as e to the minus one plus i times x squared. I think that would be a good way to write this. Then maybe we'll collapse this one plus i into a single object and combine it with the x squared. So in particular, maybe we'll let alpha equal the square root, and I guess I should carefully say the principal square root of one plus i. So that means it's the square root that is in the first quadrant. But now we can rewrite this kind of nicely as two, and then we have the integral from zero up to infinity of the real part of e to the minus alpha squared x squared plus the imaginary part of e to the minus alpha squared x squared dx where again, alpha is defined to be that square root, so alpha squared will be one plus i, and we retrieve this stuff that's written in pink. So let's bring this up to the top and then we'll continue our calculation. On the last board, we got our goal integral down to twice the integral from zero to infinity of the real part of e to the minus alpha squared x squared plus the imaginary part of e to the minus alpha squared x squared, where alpha was the square root of one plus i. Now we want to work with this a little bit until we get it down to really just a complex number calculation. So let's first of all, make a little bit of a u substitution that will help us simplify this down to a well-known integral. So in particular, I'll take u and set it equal to alpha times x. Okay, but if u is equal to alpha times x, then that means that dx is one over alpha times du. So that's pretty straightforward just by taking differentials of both sides. Furthermore, when x is equal to zero, u is equal to zero, as x tends towards infinity, u also tends towards infinity, so the bounds of integration are the same. So what does that leave me with? I will have two times the real part of one over alpha. That's what I get from bringing the one over alpha out of this 
times the integral from zero up to infinity of e to the minus u squared du. So again, that's what's happening here. And for this next portion, I'll have the imaginary part of one over alpha times the integral from zero up to infinity of e to the minus u squared du. And if something a little subtle is happening. With this substitution, it means that u here is just a real variable. So we can evaluate this guy just as the Gaussian integral. So I've made a couple videos about the Gaussian integral. You can check those out if you want to. I'll just take the value of this as the well-known value. But before we do that, let's notice that the Gaussian integral is a portion of both of these terms. So that means we can factor it out. So at this stage, we have two times the real part of one over alpha plus the imaginary part of one over alpha. And then all of that is multiplied into this Gaussian integral, the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus u squared du. But then as I said, the value of this Gaussian integral is well known. It's the square root of pi over two, so we can just insert that here and we'll see that our goal integral has a value of the square root of pi times the real part of one over alpha plus the imaginary part of one over alpha. So now we just have to figure out that real part and that imaginary part given the definition of alpha up there. So let's do that on the next board and we'll be done. Where are we so far? We've gotten our goal integral down to the square root of pi times the real part of one over alpha plus the imaginary part of one over alpha, where alpha is the complex number given by the principal square root of one plus i. So now we need to calculate that. And we're gonna use the polar form of alpha in order to do that along with a couple of tricks. So let's notice that the polar form of this inside is equal to the square root of two times e to the i pi over four. And so why is that? Well, let's notice that e to the i pi over four is cos pi over four plus i sine pi over four. But cos and sine pi over four are one over root two. That will cancel this root two and leave us just with one plus i. And now we could rewrite this maybe as the square root of the square root of two. You might say, well, we could write that as the fourth root of two, but I'm gonna leave it as this square root of the square root of two just for our calculation. And then e to the i pi by eight. So that's what we're left with with this alpha. But now from here, it's fairly straightforward to calculate one over alpha. So let's notice that one over alpha will be equal to one over the square root of the square root of two times e to the minus i pi over eight. But I'll expand that into cosines and sines so we can easily extract the real part and the imaginary part. So this will be cosine of minus pi over eight, but cosine is an even function. So that's the same thing as cosine of pi over eight. And then we have minus i sine of pi over eight, where I use the fact that sine is an odd function. So now we can maybe put this value of alpha into this real part operator and this imaginary part operator. But notice the real part and the imaginary part are easy to get at by this expansion. Furthermore, we can bring this one over the square root of the square root of two out for good measure. Okay, so that's gonna leave us with the square root of pi over the square root of two. And so as you can see, that's maybe why I wrote that as the square root of the square root of two. So it will interact with the square root of pi nicely. And then next we'll, we will have cosine pi over eight minus i sine pi over eight. Now, if you find a good trig chart, you can find values of cosine pi over eight and sine pi over eight. Or in fact, you could use the half angle formula to calculate these, but I wanna use a little bit of a trick that allows us to do it without the half angle formula. And that trick will be to square these and simultaneously take the square root and then use some trigonometric identities. So let's see what that'll leave us with. So we'll have the square root of pi over the square root of two 
times cos pi over eight minus sine pi over eight. So I didn't really do anything there except for bring these two square roots together and let's notice that this thing is squared. Okay, so now I'll multiply that out. That'll leave me with the square root of pi over the square root of two. And then I'll have cosine squared pi over eight plus sine squared pi over eight minus two cosine pi over eight times sine pi over eight. So that's just from doing this binomial expansion here where I've written it in kind of a non-standard order for a binomial expansion, but I've done that so that I have my cosine squared plus sine squared here, which clearly just adds to the number one. Okay, so let's continue this. So this will leave us with the square root of pi over the square root of two. Then we have one minus two times cosine of pi over eight times sine of pi over eight. Now, where can we go from here? Well, this is actually embedded into the half or double angle formula, depending on how you look at that. And this object, this one minus two times the cosine pi over eight and sine pi over eight can in fact be rewritten as one minus sine of pi over four. So again, that's just either the half angle formula or the double angle formula, depending on how you're looking at it. But sine of pi over four is well known. It's one over the square root of two or the square root of two over two if you prefer. So this will give us the square root of pi over the square root of two. And then we're left with one minus the square root of two over two. And then if we wanted to, we could rewrite that a little bit, but I think that's a fairly nice way to leave our solution. So what have we done? We have taken our goal integral and rewritten it as this number right here, the square root of pi over the square root of two times one minus root two over two. And that's a good place to stop.